Hey, this is Pastor Eric, and you're listening to a special edition of Living the Message, recorded live at the Moody Church on August 7th, as we took questions from a live audience and wrapped up our series on the Sermon on the Mount. Listen in on this conversation. Well, hello, everyone. How are you doing today? It's good. (laughs) Good. This is Living the Message, where we discuss how the message of Christ might dwell among us richly. This is our first live Live recording of Living the Message. So glad to have you guys with us. Yeah. (laughs) I'm Eric Targe. I serve here as pastor for University Students and Disability Ministries. All right. I'll take it from my college students. (laughs) Uh, and I'm here with senior pastor of the Moody Church, Philip Miller. How's hey, it going, Eric. Philip? This is great. It's so fun to be here. Yeah, I'm really excited to kind of unpack the entirety of the Sermon on the Mount right now. No questions off well, limits, right? We've got we a ton of everything. questions. Yeah, we got a ton of questions that were submitted through Slido. I'm going to give people a few more minutes online and in person to vote up questions, see which one's the most important. But I want to ask you a question to get us started, Philip. Okay. So, so here's the question that's been on my mind. When someone preaches a sermon, one of the big things that you, you learn is that you should have a big idea, like one thing that your listeners are supposed to, to take away. And I know that's more kind of modern homiletical rules, but would you say that there's a big idea that Jesus wanted us to take away from the Sermon on the Mount? As, as followers yeah. of him, what was the big thing that we're to take away? Yeah, I think Jesus wants us to follow him. Just follow me, right? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This amazing offer to live in the the life and goodness of God um, right here, right now, and then forever in glory. And it's all on offer in Jesus. And if we'll just come, follow him, believe in him, apprentice our lives to him, we can step into this glorious life, this abundant life of the kingdom of heaven. So come follow me. Come follow me. Come follow me. It's a simple big idea. You can take it away. Yeah. Now we're taking questions from the entirety of the Sermon on the Mount. (laughs) Here we go. Anything that's come up. And so one of the questions we received was, I know we're supposed to pray for our enemies, according to Matthew 5, 34. You hit on that kind of toward the beginning. What exactly are we supposed to pray? And is it wrong to pray for their punishment? (laughs) So is it it wrong to pray? So this question comes from M. Uh, they probably Excellent. have some enemies in mind, so they didn't want to put their full name. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah so I, what, what Jesus is teaching us is, uh, in praying for our enemies, is this is how God approaches his enemies, hmm. right? When we were yet sinners and enemies of God, he came after us. He loved us and pursued us and lavished his his grace upon us, even people who are non-repentant, right? He sends yeah. rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. He's, he, so, there, so there's this, um, this grace of God that's always moving toward his enemies in redemptive work, right? Yeah. And he's teaching us to share in that same disposition toward our enemies, which is not human nature and it's not our instinct. Um, and so I don't know that praying for my enemy's destruction helps me much, you know? <laughs> I, I think um, if I'm to share the heart of my father, if I'm going to be a son of my father who is in heaven, I need to learn to see my enemies the way he sees his enemies, the way he saw me, mm-hmm. right? And he came after me in love. And so that's hard theology. I mean, that's hard to live that out. So how do you pray for that? Um, I, I think you pray that God's blessing would be on their life. Okay. And the way they're going to live in the fullness of God's blessing is if they come to repentance and faith and trust in Jesus. Um, that would be the best thing for their soul. So to pray blessing over their life is to pray for the work of God in their soul to bring them to life and the fullness of all that Jesus has to offer for them. Um, And actually, that starts changing my heart, doesn't it? As I pray that way, I start seeing them as more of a fellow sinner who is meant to ultimately share in the same reconciliation that I have with God. Yeah. 
So that I'm, I'm not seeing them as us and them, but I'm now like drafting alongside of them and praying that they too might enter into the grace that I have received. And so I, I think that's a way to pray. So what do we do with the imprecatory prayers? So in the Psalms, yeah. there's this whole section of prayers called yeah. imprecatory prayers where people pray for the pray destruction judgment. of their right. enemies. They sometimes pray some pretty harsh things, things yep. that make us uncomfortable. Are those prayers that Christians, we should say, uh-uh, not praying those anymore? Or well, how does that work? Yeah, so I think the imprecatory psalms are these prayers of vindictive, like, you know, may you thrash them and may their graves be exhumed and may their bodies be burnt and like all this stuff, yeah, yeah. right? It's, it's terrible stuff. Um, but it's honest. Yeah. Because we all <laughs> feel that way sometimes. And people have hurt us so badly, we want the worst for them. And I think mm. the psalms are showing us that even the worst parts of our hearts can be brought before the Lord. He can handle it. Yeah. And actually, he's praying those things, but he's not acting on them, mm. which is really important. Yeah. He's entrusting those awful things, impulses, into the hands of God, mm. which means he's, in a sense, entrusting himself to the one who judges justly, who will make sure justice is served. And so he's, he's, he's not being the, the judge and jury or the prosecutor, he's handing it off to God to do it. So I think all that's instructive. But I also think, Eric, that on this side of the cross, having seen how Jesus loved me as his enemy, I can't pray those prayers in the same way anymore. Yeah. I think the cross changes our hearts substantially so that I, I actually don't wanna pray those prayers that way anymore. Okay. Because Christ has taught me a better way the way of the kingdom, right? Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that's So I, I think they're honest, they're exemplary, they're entrusting our worst impulses to God, not taking action on it, but in light of the cross and God's enemy love for me, I really can't pray that way anymore. Hmm. So anyway. Thank you, Philip. We had uh, quite a few questions come in from parents. And so I'm, I want to oh, kind of summarize good, these good. a little bit. One parent anonymously put in how their child has walked away from the faith and they're wondering how to bring them back. And I think it, it's, it's good to add to that a question that came in from Kevin. He said, how do we be part of organized church and not appear as Pharisees to our millennial children? Oh, yeah. So how, how does that work together? So millennial children, Gen Z children, I think all millennials are now uh, over 18. And so, but like, so adults. I'm technically yeah, a millennial. You, both of us are just, millennials, which is just wild. Just the worst thing in the world. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm like the rock. oldest millennial. Yeah, we, we, we do. We're the best. It's Gen Z that's the problem, I say to um, my college students. <laughs> yeah. So, first of all, if, if, you've got, um, if you've got a kid who's wandered away from the faith, they're kind of going off on their own, maybe an expressive individualism route, yeah. or if you think about the, the, the parable that Jesus tells of the prodigal son, right, who kind of goes and lives it up and makes a royal hash of his life. That's a really hard journey, and, um, and, and the, the hardest thing is we aren't in control, right? Yeah. They, the people are free souls, and we can't control them. And, and I think the more we try to control them, the worse we make it. Um, and so I think the best thing we can do is to pray fervently um, that God would pursue them in love, like he pursued us, right? And it's, it's never, it's not the end of the story, it's a chapter, right? And so yeah. God is a great redeemer, and, and you may see that redemption, and you may never see it. It yeah. may happen after your life on earth is, is gone. Yeah. Um, but God is pursuing in love, and I think you, you want to pray in concert with that. Um, it's a really hard journey. Um, I, think, I think you pick your battles carefully, yeah. make Jesus the main thing. Um, this is really interesting. God's primary objective for us is not that we be moral people. That's a symptom. The main objective God has for us is that we're reconciled with God. Hmm. That's the main thing. And so we, we spend a lot of time trying to clean up people's lives and give them advice on how to live. And the primary thing is, what will you do with Jesus? That's the primary thing. And so keep bringing it back to that. Yeah. It's not about lifestyle. It's not about a set of choices. It's about where are you in relationship with God. And once that's right, the other stuff tends to sort itself out, you know? 
So I, keep the main thing the main thing. Keep the gospel centrance, central. Play the long game. Keep, <laughs> keep sitting with and eating with sinners and tax collectors who happen to be your own kids. That's okay, right? But keep loving them um, because you never know. You never, God doesn't give up on us, and, and so we don't either, right? Yeah. So how do we live, how do we do church without falling into moralism? This is a good question, okay? Because... Yeah it's really easy to, to mix these up because they look the same on the outside. Yeah, it's similar to right? something Greg asked. He said, if people try to mainly live by, uh, the Sermon on the Mount without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, yep. isn't that a problem? And I think oh, that totally. feeds into what you're That's about to, moralism. to say. That's moralism. And here's the thing. I grew up in church, and I lived as a moralistic therapeutic deist for a long time, like most of my life, actually. Um, and And... Even though I had the right theology at one point, well, let me just tell you my story. So I grew up and I was really good at being good. I'm a firstborn. I like to please my parents. Um, and I learned early in life that if I did right things and I scored the goal at soccer and I got the good report card that my parents paid attention, they applauded, and that was like love. And it was so I learned this transaction. I figured it was the same way with God. God's got a big family. He's, you know, I'm sort of lost in the bunch, but if I perform really well, he'll notice, he'll love me, and I'll know I'm okay. That's, that's moralistic therapeutic deism, okay? And, um, and I thought, well, I sin on occasion, but God just kind of cleans me up, you know? It's sort of like getting points knocked off your license when you take the, you know, the driver's ed class, and they kind of let you go back to neutral. I thought that's what Jesus was for. And then it was when I was like 13, and I got into like actual sin in my life. And um, I, I realized I was, I was broken, I was sinful, I had a problem. It wasn't just a bunch of sin that needed to be cleaned off my life, I needed a heart transplant. And for the first time in my life, my moralism cracked because I wasn't good enough. And I ran to God and I said, help. <laughs> And for the first time in my life, I tasted grace and mercy. And he loved me broken. He loved me in my sinfulness. And I didn't know that God loved me like that. I always thought I had to offer my righteousness, and then he would bless that. But he loved me broken and sinful. That blew my mind. So I tasted grace. But then I went right back to managing my sin, managing my holiness before God as a Christian. I went back to my muscle memory of moralism. So I knew I was in by grace, but I figured I had to sustain my standing through my own efforts. And so I became, I was very moral and good, and I was self but I, you know, that doesn't work. The gospel brings us in, and the gospel grows us up. It's all by grace, all through faith, all in Christ alone. And so the problem I tried to then, what didn't work for my salvation, I tried to use for my sanctification. Right? And I tried to use moral efforts to achieve some sort of place within the kingdom. And that lasted until my late 20s. And I was a pastor and a seminary grad, and I was doing like all this stuff. Like I was, listen, God was lucky to have me on his team. That's what I thought, right? <laughs> That's moralistic thinking. That's Pharisee thinking. Thank God I'm not like those sinners. That's a problem. Like that self-righteousness under my righteousness, I had to learn to repent for the good things I had done for the wrong reasons. That, this, is, this blows your mind, right? That I had done good things for the wrong reasons, trying to earn my place at the table when Jesus wanted to invite me by grace all along. And so that's, that finally, it's a long story, but it finally melted me out as the gospel I started learning to live in the gospel, not just to get in by the gospel, but to live by the gospel and to believe that I'm loved for Jesus' sake and nothing I do adds or subtracts from his finished work. So that's, so how do we make sure that doesn't happen? I don't know. Because what, what I think happens with little kids, and this is happening with my kids, is the primary thing we correct is their behavior. And so they start with a law-based relationship with God, with, with the household and with God. I th these are the rules, live by them. And it's over time that it has to ultimately become an issue of the heart. Yeah. 
and they have to have an encounter with the gospel, and they have to see Jesus as their Savior, their only sufficient foundation for their life. How do we help them navigate? I think one of the things I can do for my kids is confess my sin out loud to them. Mm. Because, because if the only way I can confess my sin is if my moralism is shattered, right? If I'm building a righteousness on my own, I can't admit to my flaws. Yeah. So if I'm willing to say, Daddy messed up, Daddy was wrong, Daddy hurt you, I'm very, very sorry. I've asked Jesus to forgive me, and He is so merciful and gracious to me, and I ask you to forgive me as well, right? Mm -hmm. If I can do that, that doesn't make sense in a moral framework, yeah. in therapeutic moralistic theism. That does, or I said it wrong, but you know what I mean? Yeah. And um, that doesn't work in that schema. That only works in the gospel. I think that's one of the best ways is for me to model a life of repentance for my kids. That's such a good word. Every night before my kids go to sleep, we, we go through a praise you, a sorry Lord, a thank you, and a please Lord. And I, I find that that sorry is often one of the hardest things because I want to model the confession and showing my children that I'm broken, but it's easy to make that kind of like a fake sorry. It's like, yeah. sorry I didn't talk to you more or sorry I kind of <laughs> like, it's like, well, no, right. no, no. I, we, right. we need to genuinely model repentance to our children. Pastor Philip, uh, one of the questions here, and this is a hard one. It's based on today's sermon. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to answer it. Uh, but somebody asked, how many times have you actually watched Frozen? <laughs> so if um, you didn't hear the message, for those who are listening to this later, this message was basically the gospel according to Frozen. <laughs> uh, it really was. <laughs> I, I've seen it at least... Probably at least five or six times. So only five or six? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, no, so right. I have a I have a soon to be five year old daughter. I've seen it at least a thousand. Yeah, no, we <laughs> so we watched it with my kids and they all cried so hard when oh, when okay. you know Anna lays down her life and they're frozen in the you know, the tear and the Ah. Yeah. It's like it's I cry every time. Really? Like, oh, oh wow. yeah. Okay. Like big ugly tears. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah, my children must be sadists. They yeah. love it every no, no. time. They're constantly so, singing Let It Go. So we've only watched it once with the kids. But I've watched it. I've, I've watched it just Krista and me like probably four or, four or five times. Hold back your judgment, yeah. people. Hold back your judgment. Okay, so here, here's a real Let question. it go. Let it go. Let, Let it go. go. Let it go. Let it go. So here, here's a real question uh, from earlier in the series about false teachers. So there's yep. this whole section in the Sermon on the Mount on false teachers, and you, you kind of helped us understand that a little bit, but can we just go a little bit deeper? So this question comes in anonymously asking, in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, he talk, Jesus talks about false teachers. How can we tell if someone is a false teacher, and are there false teachers we should know about now? So please don't call out members of the pastoral staff, <laughs> uh, but no. no. <laughs> but totally, uh, yeah. totally. So, um, so what Jesus is primarily calling out in the Sermon on the Mount is the Pharisees. They're, they're the false teachers. They're, yeah. they're the false guides. He calls them blind guides, whitewashed tombs, right? They look good on the outside, but they're full of dead bodies, dead bones. Um, he calls them blind leading the blind. He calls them a, a brood of vipers. He, I mean, like, he is relentless toward the Pharisees. And the reason is they have taken the good, beautiful way of the old covenant which is salvation by grace through faith in a sacrifice, in the promise of God. That's how salvation has always been. And they have twisted it into a kind of moralistic religion where you keep the rules to get blessings and it's transactional. And they've lost the good news. And, you know, Jesus says you're, you're straining at a, you know, a gnat, you swallow a camel. Like, it's like what, you're missing the whole thing. And so in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, that's the false teachers he has in mind, is the, the primary teachers that are shepherding Israel. And he says, they're, they're, not, they're not good. They're, they're leading you astray. And if you follow them, you'll get bit in the end, right? This is a destructive group of people. That's why the whole Sermon on the Mount is contrasting that. This is what blessed life looks like. It's not what the Pharisees say. It looks like this. Um, you've heard it said, but I say to you, 
don't be like the hypocrites. When you pray, fast, and give, you do it this way, right? Mm-hmm. So everything is this contrast with, with, the, with the… Now, does that happen today? Absolutely. Um, it's really easy to see in like the healthy, wealthy gospel circles where it's like if you just are good and you do these things and you pay this money and you like check these boxes, God will bless you. It's like a formula and if you just hack it, you can get ahead in life. And you know who those people are. They're, they're very, they're very uh, popular, they're affluent because you're still in control in that arrangement. You are working a transaction. You're still the champion of your own soul. You don't have to fall on grace in that scenario. And so it's very popular. I think moralistic therapeutic deism is kind of everywhere. It's just kind of in the water. And I think churches play into it unknowingly because people will come to hear, like, here's five ways so you can have a better marriage. There's nothing wrong with that. But what I really want is I want to use God to get a better marriage. That's not about relationship with God, and I don't need atonement and grace. I just need to hack the system, right? I need a life hack so that I can have a better marriage. And what I really want is a better marriage. I want blessings. And so what do I have to do, moralistic, to have the good blessings, therapeutic, and God, I really don't want a relationship with you. I just don't want to know how to hack the system, deism. That's, I think that's everywhere. And the problem is it's partially true because God's ways do work well and there is happiness and wholeness when we follow him. But that's a secondary issue. Those are symptoms. The real issue is an issue of the heart and that's what God's after. He wants a relationship with you by grace through faith in Jesus. And then all the other stuff flows out of that. So there's a difference between trying to get blessings through transaction versus a transformative experience of grace that then sends me out to live in a good way. Very different. Hmm. So I think it's everywhere. And that's why we need to be inoculated with sermons like this, right? Because it's everywhere. Pastor Philip, this came up a thousand, like a whole bunch of times, not a thousand times, and, but uh, oh, let me oh, just oh, say oh, this. go for it. And it always, that never works. And I think half of our kids that leave the faith are not leaving Jesus and the gospel, they're leaving moralistic therapeutic deism because mm-hmm. they realize that doesn't work. And I'm not, I'm trying to be really good and I'm, I don't feel loved and I'm estranged. I, have, I feel like an orphan and I'm trying really, really, really hard. And they're like the older brother in the, um, the prodigal son story, right? I've been slaving for you all these years. You never gave me a goat, right? Well, who wants that life? That's miserable, it's miserable. So they run out and they go to expressive individualism because it's the only alternative they know. And so anyway, so I think the gospel can bring people home, but you've got to see it in distinction with moralistic therapeutic deism because there's no life in that. Feel free to keep submitting questions, voting for the questions sorry, that, I cut you, that you most want. No, no, you're good. I just want to get to as many of these people's questions as possible. A whole bunch of people uh, have talked about this tension that exists from what we've been looking at in the Sermon on the Mount and even what you preach today about building your life on the rock. I, I think a lot of the questions I've seen uh, ask about easy believism. Like, hey, is it enough just to say, hey, I, I believe in Jesus. I put my faith in him. Do you actually have to, to live for him? Uh, so exam- for example, one of the anonymous questions we have says, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's John yep. 14, 15. Isn't obedience part of building your house on the rock? Matthew 19, 17 to 19. Yeah. So how do we balance? If you hear yeah. and do, yeah, You'll so are, are we commanded to both do? Is it, re- like, w- what does that look like? Is it enough just to believe, or do we need to repent? How do we yeah. understand these? Okay, so this is a really good phrase. You can write this down, okay? Write it down. It is faith alone that saves, but the faith that saves is never alone. Okay. It is faith alone that saves, but the faith that saves is never alone. We, we are saved by grace through faith in Christ, and that salvation always works itself out in obedience of some kind. It, it, it is, it always, it's the fruit that is naturally and necessarily evidenced on a life that is rooted in the gospel. But we don't, 
look to our fruit for confidence, we look to our roots in Christ for confidence. We always look to Christ, and the fruit is born as we anchor in Christ. It's very important to distinguish between fruits and roots, right? And so, um, yes, the, Jesus is inviting us to apprentice our lives, our belief system, and the our every action and interaction. The Sermon on the Mount is, I can give you a righteousness on the inside that's better than the scribes and Pharisees. See, they just glom on behavior from the outside in. I'm going to transform you from the inside out. Yeah. I'm going to give you a new heart, a new spirit. I'm going to write my law on you so that you now obey all that I command you right? The Spirit guides us into a life of righteousness. As Paul says, so that um, the righteous requirements of the law are fully met in us who walk according to the Spirit. That's why the fruit of the Spirit list, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, ends with, against such things there is no law. This is what the law is about. So, a lawful life flows from a gospel-transformed heart, not the other way around. Yeah. It's an inside-out versus outside-in change. Mm -hmm. The next question I want us to, to look at was, got quite a few votes, and it's a little bit more of a personal pastoral question. I think as people have listened to the Sermon on the Mount, read it in the past, there's a tendency to look and go, wait, but that's not the church. The Beatitudes don't tend to describe what we tend to think of modern evangelicalism. This person uh, wrote, they said, I tend to isolate myself because of the negative experiences I had with Christians. It worries me to be like this. What do I do? Yeah. So at the heart of this question is what I think we said earlier, which is the popular level version of Christianity is moralistic therapeutic deism. And no one wants to be around those people because they're cranky and they're arrogant and they're self-righteous and they condemn everyone around them and they, right? I mean, who wants to hang out with that? And the problem is our churches are full of that kind of um, demeanor. They're, it's Pharisees. They're wolves in sheep's clothing. Jesus warned us about this, right? And, um, and I don't like any of that either, Eric. <laughs> Like, like, that's the hardest part about doing what I do and being a pastor is, Pharise listen, Pharisees crucify Jesus wherever they find him. Pharisees crucify Jesus wherever they find him. So if you live like Jesus, Pharisees will come after you. Hmm. And this is the hardest thing about pastoral ministry is not tender sheep that are willing to be led. It's Pharisees that stab you in the back. That's... Hmm. That's why pastors quit ministry. And the reality is it's far easier for us to live in a kind of Pharisaic, therapeutic, moralist, moralistic, therapeutic deism um, than to fall on grace and let it sweep us off our feet. I mean, we lose control if the gospel grabs a hold of our heart. Like he can ask anything he wants of us. If, if, if you get loved all the way down, like the gospel says, like, you, you don't, your, your life's not your own anymore. The love of Christ compels you to live a different kind of life. And, and you're, you surrender. And that's what's so hard. It's much easier to just work out a transaction with God where you just, I'll just clean up my act a little bit and you bless me. That seems so much less invasive. But that's not the gospel. And so I think that's an honest question. And I would just encourage my brother or sister um, Find the most gospel-rich place you, you know and go there. Just go with those people. And, and a gospel-rich environment is, are people that are incredibly humble because they realize they're far more sinful than they ever dared imagine. And they also are deeply secure because they know they're far more loved than they ever hoped, right? Yeah. And it's this paradox of humility and and deep confidence, Paul calls it joy, that, that is our life. And if you feel that, if you experience that fruit of that kind of sweet gospel, um, it, and it's full of obedience. It's not an easy believism, and it's, not, it's like full of apprenticing my life to Jesus. I want to live in holiness in this relationship 
that I have by grace, it's a beautiful thing. And I, I think the more we live that way, the more we uh, speak out of that heart, um, the more attractive, yeah. you know, people are drawn to that. Jesus was the most righteous person on the planet. And sinners and tax collectors felt magnetically drawn to him. Hmm. And our experience of holiness is often the opposite, yeah. which means it's not holiness. Yeah. So, Can I add something to that, Pastor Philip? I just, I, I think of whoever this is who, who wrote this in, and I, I want them to know most of all, because I think there's a, a tendency in our hearts when we isolate to think, okay, God doesn't want me anymore. Like God's mm. not after me because I've right. gone my own way, I've messed up, I haven't yeah. been a part of his body. And I, I just want that person to know, whoever you are, that, that Jesus is still coming after you. That's right. I, I want yeah. you to know that the disciples of Jesus, his 12 disciples had that same experience. They saw Judas and they said, Judas totally messed up. It wasn't real. But Jesus still came after them and welcomed them back. He didn't say, oh, well, you left, I'm done with you. You had a bad experience with one, and now you go your own way. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to encourage you, come back. Yeah. Be, be connected to the body. You're loved, as, as you regularly say, you're loved more than you know. Yeah. And that's why I say it, because I, I think our hearts are prone to forget that. Yeah. Um, we live like orphans instead of children of God, and our muscle memory is to, to live that way. And so that's why mm -hmm. I say it all the time. Yeah. Here's a, another question that's gotten quite a few votes. I think it's tied to the Sermon on the Mount because the Sermon on the Mount has quite a few ethical components to it, yeah. right? There's some kingdom ethics that influence uh, so many aspects of our life, but uh, part of that is our politics should be influenced by, by Jesus, yeah. right? There's, there's mm -hmm. no part. And so this question asks, the church is divided by politics more than theology these days. Yeah. And I'm most concerned by those who claim there's a Christian party. How do we respond? What, how does the Sermon on the Mount speak to, to those who would say, hey, there's this one way or yeah. another way? So it's interesting. I'm reading uh, Tolstoy's War and Peace right now. Oh. And uh, yeah, you knew I was going there, right? Yeah. Um, there's this, I, I just got to it. It blew my mind. There's this passage where Russia's being invaded by Napoleon and the, uh, the Orthodox, Russian Orthodox Church hands down an official prayer to be prayed in all of the, all of the churches. Hmm. And, um, and in that prayer, it says things like, please be with your, your people, Russia, um, protect Israel from all aggression, um, protect your people. Like, in other words, they've identified the Russian people with the Israelite covenant people of God in the Old Testament. Oh, so they weren't praying for the nation of Israel. They were praying for themselves no. as Israel. They're praying, protect us as your Israel. Okay, so Russia was as the Russia, Israel. Russia, which okay, is interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So what they did is they baptized Christianity with Russian nationalism hmm. and then expected God to defend it as a nation against the French, which is very fascinating. And, um, and I thought Americans were the only ones who did this. <laughs> but the Russians did it before us. And this is a danger. Um, Jesus is bringing his kingdom into the world, which has, which has no borders. It is a kingdom that will envelop the, to the ends of the earth. And it is the way of Jesus under the rule of Jesus our king that is our primary citizenship now. Paul will say we are citizens of heaven, not of earth. Um, to the Philippians, who had prized position as citizens of, of Rome. Philippi had a special arrangement where they got to be citizens of Rome even though they didn't live in Rome. And, Jesus, er, er, and Paul says, listen, you think that's special, but don't you forget where your real citizenship lies. It's in, in Christ, in his kingdom, your citizenship is in heaven. So I, I think it's very important for us as believers in Jesus to keep the kingdom of God primary um, and then go vote. But we can't get those flipped, right? I, this will mess you up a little bit. I love America, and uh, my grandpa was in the military and saluted like up until his dying day, and I, 
I learned patriotism from my grandpa. So we're a mil- like I have military family. I love America. But do you realize the kingdom of God will outlast America? Amen. The kingdom of God will outlast America. Um, St. Augustine wrote a book, The City of God and the City of Man, because Rome was falling. And Rome had identified Christians with Rome. If you were a Roman citizen, you were a Christian, and, and vice versa, right? And so the people, in, as Rome was falling, had to disentangle their identity from their Ro- Roman citizenship, which had, which had been equivalent with their Christianity. They had to disentangle that so that they, as Rome fell, they didn't go down with Rome. They actually translated, transferred the weight of their citizenship into the city of God, which would endure. Does that make sense? So I think whenever our culture is going through a convulsion like we've been through, the easy thing is to just assume p- politics will be our savior and to like baptize Jesus into this like political frame rather than live for the kingdom and keep that primary and then just go vote. Yeah. But to, to never confuse my primary calling, my primary identity, my primary citizenship as the kingdom of heaven. I think that's really important that we keep that straight. Mm. And that'll keep you from doing dumb things like de- defending politicians that are indefensible, right? Because then you just lose credibility. So. Mm. Thank you, Pastor Philip. We have time for maybe two, maybe three questions more. I encourage you now, go to slido.com, vote on those questions that you most want us to answer, and they will be put up on the top. If you have a question that you want to put in, still you can put that in. We'll see how much time we have left. Here's a question, though, that was voted on a little bit. I want to see what you have to say about it, because it's on the Sermon on the Mount. Earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, we hit Matthew 6.15. Do you want to pull that up for us for a moment? I Matthew 6.15. I believe it's something along the lines of, uh, if you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven, right? Yeah. What, what does it say there? If you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So this person, R, uh, says, it sounds like forgiveness is contingent on our forgiving. Please explain again what the verse means in light of justification by faith alone. Yeah. So um, I'm trying to rack through the, the language I use when we preach that message. So whoever asked this question, go back and listen to my message on this because we did hit that. We hit it really hard. <laughs> um, the, the relationship between the forgiveness we receive and the forgiveness we're called to extend is not one of causation. It's one of correlation. It's not mm. causation. It's correlation. If I have to forgive others to be forgiven, then um, it's a transaction again. And I'm back in moralistic therapeutic deism, right? So I got to do this good thing so God will love me. But the forgiveness I receive from God is intended to naturally and necessarily flow out in forgiveness to other people. So if I find myself unable to forgive, it's an indicator that I've not fully metabolize the forgiveness that God has given to me. Mm. And so there's a correlation between the forgiveness I give and the forgiveness I receive. So it's, again, it's roots and fruits. The forgiveness that is a fruit of my life flows from the forgiveness that is at the root of my life. And if I'm well-rooted in forgiveness, I will naturally learn to forgive. And so um, that's, that's how that works. And so Jesus is saying, look, if you, if you can't forgive other people, you should, you should do some heart search and ask yourself if you've really been forgiven. Because if you've been forgiven um, millions of dollars of sin debt, right, chief of sinners, how can you not forgive the person who just, you know, is irritable whenever you see him, right? I mean, it's, it's like the, the cosmic forgiveness you've received is so much greater than the offenses at given to you. That's the logic yeah. of, of the gospel. So I have a question here I'm going to combine. In fact, so it's two questions I'm combining here. But somebody, Jay, has asked, how do you go about sharing Christ with someone you love who has moved from moralistic therapeutic deism to expressive individualism? And I think that's more and more yeah. common. People tend to, they go from there and they say, you know what, I'm just going to do me. I'm right. going to do my life. And then to, to combine that with another question that was asked anonymously, is there a point with that kind of person that you just give up? 
Like, is there a point, that, question, that one had a lot of votes on it, is there a point right. where we should just say, you know what, I I'm not gonna share the gospel anymore. I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave you to your own yeah. way. So how do I share the gospel? to someone who's rejected moralistic therapeutic deism but now lives in an expressive individualism. They're the Elsa, let it go. Right. I think the first thing I have to help that person realize is I don't believe what they rejected either. Huh. Because what do you mean by that? They, went, they, ran, they ran away from something that wasn't the gospel. Okay. So I have to help them see that I don't believe what they rejected. That's, that's not the relationship with God that I have. Okay. That's probably all they think exists. Hmm. Um, and so the first task is to help differentiate myself from moralistic therapeutic deism. Okay. And so that's where I have I got to talk about grace, forgiveness, personal relationship with Christ, that he's changing me. I've never been so loved. I can't believe I'm forgiven. Like, that won't fit their paradigm. Yeah. Right? Because they, that's not what they left. And so all of that will, I think, be contagious. Um, Anna's a great example. She never gives up. She pursues in love. She won't take no for an answer. Um, and she demonstrates radical self-sacrificing love in a way that melts her out. Hmm. And I don't know how to do that. There's no formula for that. But I would, I would encourage people, if you love them, never to give up on them. Never give up. Um, I mean, God never gave up on you, right? Hmm. The, the ultimate condemnation is when God leaves us to ourselves. Is this okay? I'm f fine. You don't want me? Fine. I'll leave you alone. And um, that's the ultimate condemnation, right? And um, I mean, I, sometimes it gets there, but I, yeah. but I don't, I would pursue in love as long as I can. Now, if people are really toxic and hurtful and they're burning the house down, I mean, that's obviously you can't live like that. Um, but as long as there's a relationship that's somewhat there, I would keep running hard. Hmm. And it's vulnerable. Right? And it might feel like crucifixion at times. Um, but that's the way of the cross, right? Yeah. So. I think this will be our final question for today, Pastor Philip. And I think it encapsulates kind of the goal of this podcast, which is living the message. Jan asks, how does one actualize living for, uh, living for Jesus day by day, moment by moment, surrendering oneself to him? How do we actually mm, do this? That's a good question. How do we live the Sermon on the Mount? Yeah. At every moment of every day, God is with you. And so you can live in that reality and metabolize His presence and power and goodness and resources, or you can just kind of go about your day as if he's not there. And I, I, th there, I mean, what is it? Is it Brother Andrew practicing the presence of, oh, yeah. of God? I mean, he set his watch. <laughs> it's kind of a weird thing, but he set his watch to just like chime. And, and it was like a bing, just reminder. Like God is here. He's with me. I never go into a meeting without him. I never walk the park unless God is right by my side. The Spirit of God is alive and active in me. And I can either be aware of and attuned to His presence and power, and I can just ask Him, God, God what, what do you want me to do here? How do you want me to approach this interaction? Um, boy, I'm stressed, and I'm starting to get irritable. Would you, would you help me be loving, patient, kind, good, gentle? Would, would you birth your life in me so that I might live your life in righteousness right here, right now? Help me, be with me, sustain mm -hmm. me. Like, not just on like big days, but like every day. Um, you never are alone, ever. Like you do this every night, right? You fall asleep and close your eyes and who keeps you alive? 
Who keeps you breathing all night? We had, my daughter was born, and I, the first time we left her in the little bassinet, I freaked out. I was like, if I walk out of this room and take my eyes, like, who's going to, and then I'm going to like, she's breathing on her own anyway. Like, if she stopped, I would be useless, okay? Like, I don't know how, what, who does that? God does that. He wakes you up every morning. He lavishes glory and beauty across creation to say, I love you. He, he's pursuing you in love, and every moment of every day is an opportunity to be with him and learn from him how to do life. So, like, what does it mean to just open up to that? Yeah. I, I think that's, it's, Paul says, pray without ceasing, which is not, not like one monotonous prayer that you never stop talking. In other words, prayer can be a way of life. Prayer is like an opening of the soul that can, be, that can be open to the presence of God. And it doesn't matter what I'm doing, I'm cognizant of his reality and his closeness and that his, his resources are here for me. Yeah. Like that, I think, is the, I think that's what Paul means by pray without ceasing. It's living with a soul openness to the presence of God hungry for his power and goodness in my life and just drinking it in. And I, I don't know how to say that other than it's like a prayerful state of being yeah. that's cognizant of his presence right here, right now. Yeah. You know, so I'm not answering questions by myself, right? Like he's here. I got up here, I said, fill me with your wisdom. Help my words to matter. Help them to count. Don't help me not to say anything stupid. You know, I pray that every week. <laughs> do, you, do you realize what the volume of words that I say, how, what are the chances of me saying something stupid? <laughs> right? And it's just, you know, just help me. <laughs> like, yeah. take over, speak. And then you yeah. bring your best, right? But you, it's in a, restful dependency. I don't know. Does that help? No, that, that helps a lot. I think the, the key takeaway there for, for how do we live the Sermon on the Mount, uh, I think what we can take here is practicing the presence of Christ. Yeah. I know the English Puritans write regularly about practicing the presence of Christ, and I know one Puritan recommended actually putting a chair in a room and <laughs> actually imagining Christ seated in that chair as you do yeah. everything. When I was in seminary, uh, John Piper came and preached in our chapel at Ted's up in Deerfield. And I remember at one point he encouraged all of us. He said, listen, set a timer for every hour on yeah. your iPhone. He had us all take out our iPhones. He said, set a timer to, to pray and remember God is with you even in your studies. And I think yeah. that's something that's helpful, whether you're an accountant, a lawyer, a janitor, uh, no matter what you're doing, as a, if you're a stay-at-home parent, uh, working at home parent, yeah. to, to have that remembrance of yeah. he's with me. And, and here's what's amazing, right? When you live in that way, you have resources that are not visible. Yeah. So you might be going through your life and everything's stressful. And people look at you and go, I don't know why they're joyful. But it's because you have resources that nobody can see. You have a God who's redeeming your life, a God who's working in all the bad things uh, for your good and his glory. And like he's committed to you long haul and he's going to make you like Jesus. And so all of this pain, this crucifying pain, is going somewhere. Crucifixions lead to resurrections in the kingdom of heaven. And so everything that hurts has purpose. Mm. And so, like, that, so all of a sudden you can forgive when it makes no sense. And you can, you can be joyous when it makes no sense. And you can have peace when it makes no sense because the reality of the presence of the kingdom of God is right here. And it's, it's closer than the air you breathe. It's, it's as present as the omnipresent presence of God. The spirit in you is your link to the kingdom of heaven. And he tethers your life to the eternal life of God. That's abundant living. You have abundance of resources that nobody can see. And it allows you to live right here, right now, in light of eternity. Hmm. And so you, you, you're just, you're an alien all of a sudden, right? You just, it doesn't make sense. You're, you're able to live in ways, absorb losses, keep loving when it, like, because you have a God who never gives up on you and never leaves you and never forsakes you. Like, that is the, repent for the, repent, stop your whole way of living for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's right here. 
in me. Just reach out and grab it. Just come follow me into the abundant life of the kingdom of heaven. Come follow me and live. Live. Well, if you enjoyed this conversation, we encourage you to find us on YouTube, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts. Make sure to subscribe, like, leave us a comment, a message. You can always reach out to us at livingthemessage at moodychurch.org. Again, that's one word in the email, livingthemessage at moodychurch.org. Each week when Pastor Philip preaches, we take questions. All you got to do is email, uh, text us. You can email us, but you can also text us at 312-682-1888. We thank you so much for being a part of today's live taping of Living the Message, and we hope that you were encouraged, equipped, and enabled to now go and live the message.